Charles, thank you very much uh, uh, indeed for your introduction. Um, uh, when when uh, Charles asked me some time ago to speak about the challenge of political leadership, um, I, I accepted with alacrity. Um, you know, I have worked for a few leaders. Uh, I am very political, uh, and I'm always up for a challenge. I have to say that when I... Uh, started looking at these books, though, uh, last uh, weekend, I nearly sort of shrunk away with... They all look so daunting. They're so sort of measured and well done and everything. I wasn't absolutely sure I could rise, uh, rise to the occasion. But nonetheless, I am here um, uh, and very grateful to Charles for inviting me. Indeed, it has to be said that if it were not for Charles Clark, I wouldn't be standing here today because he was instrumental in giving me my first opportunity to work uh, for uh, uh, a political leader and to get you know, up and personal and close uh, when I became Neil Kinnock's campaign director in 1985. So thank you, Charles, very much indeed uh, for enabling... For um, setting me off on this long journey and trajectory. I don't think everyone will be as grateful to you for launching me on the Labour Party uh, as I am. Um, um, however, I just have to say, because it's just thrilling, I went before I came in here, just a small diversion, to the Archive uh, Centre here. Absolutely brilliant. And Andrew, if he's here, got me uh, got, got some things out uh, from the archives, including a wonderful memorandum sent by Conservative, within Conservative Central Office to the chairman of the Conservative Party reporting to him on the new appointments made by Neil Kinnock uh, at Walworth Road uh, in September 1985. They were so efficient, these Tories. I tell you, this is a three-page memorandum on who was appointed. And it says of me, a little bit, uh, it says, in the end, it says, I like this particularly. It says, former colleagues of Mr. Mandelson say he is very able and therefore an unwelcome choice from our point of view. <laughs> he will, however, have to prove he is tough enough to push through changes in the face of any left wing opposition from within the NEC. I mean, these people were absolutely spot on. And then, it, and then it goes on, and it finishes by saying, it says something about the guy who was appointed the policy director. It says, ends by saying, it may not be too cynical to suggest that with a strong director of campaigns and communications, the role of policy development will in time become subordinate to the campaigning function. I mean, how prescient is that? I mean, it, I'm not proud of that, obviously. But, you know, I mean, they, they, they absolutely had it sp spot on, these people. Now, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit of uh, history and bring you up to date uh, with Jeremy Corbyn. Um, uh, but uh, you, you'll just have to uh, live with the uh, Labour uh, uh, bias in me. My, my knowledge uh, starts of lead Labour leaders... Uh, starts with Attlee, skips over Gate School, who I never met. Um, he was from another part of Hampstead, uh, and then, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then stretches from Wilson to Callaghan to Foot to Kinnock to Smith uh, to Blair, and then to Brown. I should say that Ed Miliband also went out of his way to befriend me. Um, uh, when I returned to the cabinet from Brussels in 2008. I have to say, during this time, it never honestly occurred to me that he aimed to substitute for his brother. I thought he just liked my company. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 it never occurred to me uh, that he might have leadership ambitions at that time. How, how, how wrong can people be? Now, let me get, in a sense, now let me get uh, straight into it. The earliest Labour leader uh, I met uh, was uh, Clement Attlee. Uh, I was 11 or 12 years old, 
and Marcia Williams introduced uh, us at 10 Downing Street in 1965. Uh, I was there at the invitation of our garden suburb neighbour, Harold Wilson. Clem, she said uh, very loudly to the former Prime Minister, this is Peter. He's Herbert's grandson. And at the mention uh, of my grandfather's name, Atley sort of slightly flinched, uh, <laughs> I, I noticed, barely looked up, uh, and then finally grunted, quite articulate by Atley's standards. Um, but I say this uh, in order to draw uh, uh, a lesson uh, from Atley's interaction uh, with my grandfather, Herbert Morrison, his, his, his deputy. And that is that leaders and second-in-commands don't actually have to like each other in order to work together, uh, and that, in fact, the more they are complementary rather than identical, uh, the greater is their reach into the party uh, and to the electorate. And if you look at the top teams, this formula actually seems to work pretty well. Um, Wilson uh, and George Brown, on a good day, uh, Wilson and Roy Jenkins, ditto, on a good day. But then look at Callaghan and Foote, who just kept the entire ship you know, afloat from 1976 to 79. Foote and Healy, uh, Kinnock and Hattersley. Don't necessarily have to love your deputy and vice versa in order uh, to be a, a dream team. Blair and Prescott. Uh, and on the Tory side, Thatcher and Whitelaw, Major and Heseltine, Cameron and Osborne. The point I'm making that each has brought something to the leader uh, uh, in party management or in some cases political argument uh, and uh, occasionally governing competence uh, as well. So the leadership matters is the point I'm making, not just the leader, uh, although inevitably it is the actual leader inevitably who matters most. And you just have to look at the difference it would have made to events and to history if the runner-up had won rather than the person uh, who got elected and if the roles had been reversed. I don't think that none of Morrison to Attlee, George Brown to Harold Wilson, Michael Foote to Jim Callaghan, Roy Hattersley to Neil Kinnock, uh, or Prescott or, 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 or Whitelaw uh, would have been anything like the leaders they were deputy to or would have been able to deliver what the leaders did or to even, in many cases, even be elected in the first place. So leaders really matter. You just have to look at the, those who are runners-up uh, to make the point. And th this, I think, uh, unique responsibility of the leader is summed up well by the book's authors, if I can paraphrase them. The ability, the responsibility, the ability to get the party in the right place to win and then govern competently in order to get re-elected. That is how I would sum up uh, the responsibility of a political uh, leader. And I put uh, winning elections without apology at the apex of the leader's role uh, because you would not expect me to do otherwise. But remember, you know, we are dealing with political parties here. We're not dealing with debating societies. We're not dealing with flower arranging clubs. We're dealing with political parties the central point of which, but I'm going to come back to this at the end of my remarks, uh, is to play the absolutely sort of seminal role in our entire political system, which is to recruit people from the public in order to hold office and govern everyone else. And it's political parties that do that, uh, which is why they are so important and why their leaders uh, are, are so pivotal. But here is the question. Has the Labour Party been less, the, than, less successful than the Conservative Party at winning elections 
because too often it has chosen or stuck with the wrong leader? And the answer must be yes. Uh, but it works the other way too, that the party itself has a nasty recurring habit uh, of destroying its own electoral chances, whoever is or however good the leader might be. And that's the difference between the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. The Labour Party uh, has a, a better unerring knack of putting itself between its voters and holding office than the Conservatives, who in the main, through history, have been a more cohesive uh, and, prof and uh, uh, professional uh, 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 political party than the Labour Party that has too often preferred <coughs> ideological dispute uh, or sort of fratricide. So a successful leader, through persuasion, uh, through self-belief and force of personality, tries to move his or her party in a winning direction. That's the job of the leader. And if the leader doesn't get this or is too indecisive or uncourageous in doing so, it's time for another leader. But time and time again through our party's history, they have chosen to stick with somebody who was either indecisive or uncourageous or otherwise not so good at the job. And the leader is the principal originator of the party's winning strategy. Uh, the leader does not wait for the strategy to come to him, not a proper leader. A good leader then recruits the best people available to flesh out uh, the, the strategy. A deficient team produces a deficient or even more deficient leader. Now, the most successful once-in-a-generation uh, Labour leaders were clearly, in my view, and I think the, books, the book supports this, were Attlee, Wilson and Blair. Each of them, each of these three, uh, was significantly, was both a progressive and a moderniser. Attlee, a rigid, uninspiring, yet um, unifying and dependable uh, figure, with enormous help from my grandfather, from Hugh Dalton and Ernie Bevin, successfully guided Labour's recovery from its electoral debacle of the 1930s through the moulding of its policy programme during the war years and then to victory in 1945. The narrative, coming from people who had proved their patriotism during the war, very important, that narrative that took the Labour Party to victory in 1945 was really strong and really clear. We must rebuild and modernise Britain and leave behind the poverty and the inequalities of the pre-war era. And everything in that Labour Party campaign revolved around that core proposition. Attlee was by no means the sole author uh, of this narrative, but more than any other, he embodied it uh, as the leader of a party of conscience and reform. Wilson, grammar school educated, very significantly, pipe smoking, uh, reassuring, uh, with a very fertile policy mind, did exactly the same after 1963, uh, with more flair and more broadly based appeal uh, than uh, Gates School before him. Recovery, again, recovery from the splits and defeats of the 1950s, the shaping of a post Grouse Moore's modernizing uh, program for Britain's economy and its society and then on to victory just in 1964. Again, Blair with knobs on after 1994. With his polish and his charm, uh, strong visionary speeches, always telling a story about the country and eager to shape the future, he delivered recovery from the devastating 1980s from which Kinnock had originally 
uh, rescued us. The complete renewal of the party's policy programme, starting with Clause 4, and then with more ingenuity and consummate political skill than Smith or Kinnock before him, led us to that victory in 1997. In the case of the Conservatives, exactly the same winning formula, in my view. Recovery, renewal, strong message were deployed by Macmillan post-Suez in 1959, Heath and Selsden man in 1970, Thatcher, obviously, in 1979, and Cameron in 2010, following the dark years of Haig, IDS, and Howard. Each successful leader, each of those I've mentioned, won the battle of ideas in the election argument, uh, achieving assertion, if not hegemony, of their political argument. They looked the part. They owned their narrative. They made good appointments. They got their parties and then the public to trust them. In each approach, Labour and Conservative, there was a completeness of leader and party. First, insight about the state of the country and what the public were looking for, empathy absolutely essential. Second, policies that were genuinely distinctive and relevant and credible. Third, using passion and discipline to drive home the message and to win confidence in both the leader and the party's offer, the two things being inseparable. Now, in each case, it was not only the leader's personal qualities that brought success, although these were, in my view, of paramount importance. What permitted success was the party not getting in the way as Labour's divisions and ideological preoccupations had done for Gate School uh, in 1959, for Callaghan in 1979, Foote in 1983, my God, and Kinnock in 1987. By 1992, I think Kinnock could have won, but frankly, the party's recovery from the 1980s had simply not gone far enough or deep enough for that to happen. So party and contextual matters, uh, contextual factors, really do make a difference. They really do matter. Not least because they can knock leaders off their stride. They can knock them off their balance. They can make leaders so much more tired and weary and distracted than if you have a sort of clear sort of line of vision uh, up the field to the electoral winning post to which to, towards which to head. Interestingly, look at the end of those Labour governments as well, Attlee uh, uh, and the rest. When the vision went stale, as Attlee's and Labour's did, frankly, by 1950, 51, uh, in which Harold's did by, the t by 1970, and Blair's, or more precisely Brown's, uh, in 2010. When the vision went stale, when the programme ran out and the message evaporated, there was defeat in each case. Now, uh, I, I feel my framework works, both in the winning and the losing, losing. Perhaps it's a question of governing stamina. One minute you have it, and the next you don't. And how you deal with events is obviously central to this. Ironically, I think the global financial and banking crisis rescued Gordon Brown's administration and his leadership. For six months, you know, he seemed to be the right man in the right place. How wonderfully events conspired to lift him up from a, a terrible mire in which he had fallen uh, since he became Prime Minister in 2007. Thank God for the banking crisis. <laughs> but then, but then, events. 
a combination of his past, Damien McBride's emails, plus his temperament, volatile, and his lack of, lack of empathy, lack of empathy as a leader. The public were much more worried about the deficit than he was, and he didn't get it. Those things, that combination, then defeated him. Now, perhaps that is the fate of former chancellors who become tail-end Charlies, as Roy Jenkins had originally predicted to me would be the case with Gordon. If so, George Osborne better watch out. <laughs> Although, as usual, the Labour Party is helping um, in, in its own way. Now, the higher you get up the food chain towards the becoming leader, your calmness and your cunning are tested. Sometimes you can be too cunning for your own good. Was this true of Harold Wilson? When he resigned in 1976, I remember exactly where I was, and I remember exactly what I thought. The brilliant magician who kept Labour together is gone, and now the Labour Party is going to fall apart. That was the very first thing I thought of when I heard the news mid-morning that Wilson had resigned. Now, on reflection, perhaps the magician became the victim of his own magic with too many compromises and too many trade-offs for the sake of internal party management or the magician's luck uh, and his stamina uh, ran out. But either way, I think people will feel vexed in their judgment of Harold Wilson for a very long time to come. I think he's a very, very interesting subject a lead, of, a, of a leadership study because he is so complex and because you can make so many arguments about him in so many different ways. For all his conscience uh, and his cunning, and both were real, some feel he used his office less well than he could have done and that his influence and the imprint that he left were weaker as a result. Which brings me, if I may, to some sort of finishing thoughts. A lot of people say, and it's easy, I must say, to agree with them when you think of sort of giants like Attlee, uh, or Wilson, or Blair, or Callaghan, a lot of people say that we don't have big politicians anymore, and that our political leaders are not like they used to be. Has that thought ever occurred to you in recent times? I, I'm afraid that po our politicians probably do come now from too narrow a cohort. They are inexperienced in politics, quite apart from any other uh, walk of life. Many of them look and sound like, well, basically what they are, which is former special advisors to real grown-up politicians. They're too identical. They've spent far too much time inside the Beltway in SW1, not enough time running businesses or working in the professions or traveling or understanding the real world, or indeed from the shop floor. I mean, people who've had to earn a living rather than being brought up, as I say, as research assistants or political advisors. I'm not sure what to suggest we do about this, but I think it's extremely serious. There is a shortfall in the quality of political leadership available to the public to vote for in our country now. Uh, and I think it is a real issue in the context of our functioning democracy and our government. The problem, actually, is, lies in the political parties. The political parties themselves have become more like sects rather than genuine mass parties unrepresentative of the population as a whole, inward-looking, always looking for sort of reaffirmation 
from those around them for, of views that they've already arrived at and don't want to think more about. I'm afraid that is... I, I'm not talking, by the way, not just about the Labour Party. I'm talking about all the political parties. And Labour's recent attempt to widen its base, um, uh, I think, has hardly succeeded except amongst in broadening uh, the Labour Party and opening it up to people, except amongst, basically, with respect, tertiary educated, middle class, and in the main people, and in the main people who come from the public sector. Those in the main are people who have come into the Labour Party this year, apart from all the ex-Green Party trots and sundry trotskists and whatever. Apart from them, the, the mass of people who have come into the Labour Party are people who sort of are already exactly like the Labour Party. Um, sort of middle-aged, sort of white, s sort of middle-class professional, sort of tertiary educated, and sort of working in the public sector. That is not, by definition, representative of the British uh, population. And therefore, I fear this may exacerbate our problems rather than provide a cure for them. Now, for a long time, Labour leaders have been criticised by some in the party uh, for being too keen on winning. Kinnock, throughout his leadership, um, was accused of electionitis. I mean, he pleaded guilty, by the way. Um, uh, Gate School was complimented for not treating Labour like a vote-maximising machine. You know, he was happy to lose votes rather than to maximise. Blair is damned. Heaven knows Blair is damned now for having won three elections in a row, uh, apparently a crime uh, for some in today's Labour Party. Now, I agree that what you do in office is more important than how you win it. But the one, I just say to you, has to precede the other for it to be put to the test. And I don't believe that uh, uh, there is any use uh, for Labour without it honestly believing that it can be elected as a progressive party committed to modernising the country, efficiently managing a mixed economy, and always, always pushing against inequalities in society. That is the job of the Labour Party. How it does so, obviously, will vary from generation to generation, uh, just as something fresh and electable now has to grow out of new Labour. You're not going to win the next election in 2020 you know, by fighting on New Labour's manifesto and battle cries of 1997. It has to be fresh, it has to be new, it has to sort of, you know, the Vatican has to sort of keep sort of renewing its thinking and you, know, you don't have to you know, reject your past, you don't have to renounce your past, you just have to sort of fold your past into something which is new and revitalised. But um, I don't think, and I agree with Charles's observation that he was making as I came in, I don't believe that uh, generating, producing something new, fresh and electable out of new labour will come from Jeremy Corbyn's uh, um, uh, leadership. And I think it's an important sort of subject to evaluate, really, because it goes to the heart, in my view, of the quality and the purpose of political leadership. I say this not just because he's too far outside the political mainstream uh, for public tastes, but actually more fundamentally than that, because he has only an ambivalent interest in making Labour a party of government. He's more at home in extra parliamentary action and the people and organisations which drive extra parliamentary action uh, and protest. Yet, something 
strange did happen when Jeremy Corbyn uh, uh, won the leadership because he chimed with something in the public's mood um, or that part of the public who are paying their three pounds precisely because he is so far outside the mainstream in a sense. He chimed with the public's mood because he's out of the mould. He doesn't look or sound like yet another sort of buttoned up, tight-lipped politician sent by central casting down there at Millbank, you know, where that awful old Mandelson machine used to reside. And this is very important for the public because he seems to be like somebody who was more himself, less sort of manufactured, less interested in how he needs to fabricate himself and therefore more authentic. Now, the public likes authenticity and their mood does not stop there. The public actually want leaders who altogether are less imprisoned by their party orthodoxy. They want individuals who are capable of thinking for themselves, who are neither sent by central casting nor taking their orders and their scripts and their photo opportunities and their clap lines from you know, the central direction department uh, of the movie at Millbank or wherever it is. But the public are also pessimistic and they find it difficult now, broadly speaking, to believe anything they're told by politicians. This cynicism, I think, puts an even greater premium on credibility. And here's the point I really want to make about Jeremy Corbyn, just to take him as an exemplar of a wider point I want to make. And that is that the authenticity that Jeremy Corbyn undoubtedly represents to the new supporters and fellow travellers that gave him victory in a party election is not, in my view, the same authenticity that the public will be looking for in a national election. For the public, the authenticity of leadership they want is one that allies conviction with credibility, resonating with people's lives as they are, not in the imaginary utopian universe of uh, a far-left leader of the Labour Party, and one which sets a credible path to progress in the future, because people aren't stupid. They're practically-minded people. They're pragmatic people, and they want to be offered something which they know is capable of happening, of being implemented. And successful political parties and their leaders understand this. Parties, by the way, in my opinion, are not redundant. I mean, I am harsh in my criticism of the state of political parties in this country. But they are still absolutely essential in defining our country's broad political values. But parties now have to work so much harder to regain trust, which they forfeited, in particular by, but not only as a result of the financial and banking crisis. And they also need to lose their antipathy, political parties, to the world that the majority of voters inhabit. Many people in parties, left and right, want to be pure. They want to think of themselves as pure political people who have a sense of belief, of ideological purity. I'm talking about Labour people or Conservative people. In other words, people who don't think like ordinary members of the public at all, which is not how people think in the real world. And too many in the centre-right and centre-left think that the centre-ground means abandoning values and diluting belief and therefore they're resistant to it. Now, it doesn't, or it doesn't necessarily, uh, 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 result in abandoning values and diluting belief. It means being more public-facing, less distant from the electorate, better able to communicate. It's what governing parties do, as opposed to protest movements. For genuine leaders, 
of effective office-seeking parties, there is now so much for them to compute the whole time and so much more for them to come to terms with, with in order uh, to create that relationship and sustain it with the public. There are so many more ways they have to communicate and are communicated with, and it's why being a political leader is harder now than it has ever been before. So what is my final, final thought about this? The fact that lep leapt off the page to me uh, in uh, reading the book on Labour brings me back to the question I raised at the beginning of my remarks. And it is that of Labour's 17 leaders down the century, only six have been elected. Whereas of the Tories' 19 leaders during the century, 16 have been elected. Now, as a Labour man, this shocks me. It shocks me, and we need to really think why. I think the explanation is that Labour, much more than the Conservatives, is a party that has always contained two cultures. One that wants to be elected, and the other that feels more comfortable with opposition. It affects who is selected as leader, and whether they can then get elected by the public. And I think it's at the heart of the Labour Party's current dilemma. But the difference between now and the past for Labour is that whereas those who are more comfortable with opposition, those who prefer protest over government, have been on the fringes of the Labour Party, now, for the first time in our history, they have actually taken the leadership of the party. And that's why I think there is a question mark uh, over the purpose of the Labour Party now and why people are asking what the Labour Party is for under Jeremy Corbyn. And nothing like this has ever happened to the Conservative Party. They've never actually been taken over by people who aren't fundamentally interested in pursuing and winning office. Now this has happened to the Labour Party for the first time. People who are more comfortable with opposition and protesting than taking the responsibility of office and government. And that's a terribly profound and fundamentally important insight about the current state of the Labour Party. I hope, for all our sakes, this does not spell permanent one-party rule uh, in Britain, but I do think it makes you think. Thank you very much.